I'd like to introduce you to Aaron Bright. Aaron started his career as a massage therapist in 2002 after graduating from the Australian College of Natural Medicine in Queensland. And he's cold today. <laughs> he just told me. <laughs> in 2006, he completed his Diploma of Remedial Massage and in 2007, his Bachelor of Health Science in Musculoskeletal Therapy. Aaron has also graduated from the University of Queensland with a graduate certificate of sports coaching, completed a certificate for in fitness and an advanced diploma of myotherapy. He currently runs his own businesses, Bright Health Training and Brisbane Workplace Massage with his wife, Cherie. Please welcome Aaron to the stage to answer the burning question of whether pain science really is a pain for massage therapists. G'day. How's the uh, volume there? Everyone hear me okay? Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, quick question, quick survey. Who had coffee? Yeah. <laughs> Who had tea? Very good. Who had peppermint tea? <laughs> Any other teas? Chamomile? Water. Water. A few waters. Good. Okay. We've got the important stuff out of the way so we can get started. Um, all right. So today, the question I'm asking and somewhat answering, is pain science a pain for massage therapists? Um, who's aware of the topic of pain science to begin with? Again, hands up. I'm going to try and keep you guys moving a little bit today because I know we're all massage therapists and if we're not doing stuff with our hands, we get a little bit anti. Um, who is not aware of some of the topics of pain science and the research of recent times? Okay, it's okay to put your hand up, it's okay. Very good. Who uh, thinks science is generally a pain? <laughs> I was expecting everyone to put their hand up then. Okay, very good. So, um, Look, science can be a pain. And I have to say, standing before you today, that I'm not a scientist. I'm not a research scientist. Last year we had a wonderful presentation from Tasha Stanton, swoon, uh, who's one of our leading scientists in the field in Australia, possibly the world. Um, and, and so for someone with that background, they really understand the science very, very well. They do it day in and day out. I uh, would perhaps be a science observer, but I'm going to do my best today to summarise and present to you some of the really key findings, research findings over the last few years, particularly as it rates, relates to massage therapy. So firstly, the question, why pain science? We're going to sort of talk about that today. Why do we care? Why do we bother? Why is it important? Like, why, 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 why? Okay, what do we know about pain at this point in time? What are, what are some of the key information we can, we can take home and share? You know, what are those one or two key points that you'll walk away from today and go, that was really useful information? Because frankly, you will forget most of it, but there might be one or two things that are really valuable to you and really valuable to your clients slash patients. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a bit of a potential framework that has started to emerge out of the research that's really appropriate to what we do. We've been talking already a lot about care and the concept of care. Um, it is much more than an elbow in a trigger point, and I'm sure we all agree, even though, hey, that does feel good from time to time. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about you know, some considerations for massage. We will have a little bit of time to just touch on uh, low back pain as well. I know that some of you will be jumping into a workshop very shortly on low back pain. Some of you won't, of course. There's just a few little things I wanted to talk about with pain science and low back pain because in many ways low back pain is a bit like the poster child for uh, pain science and, and understanding that pain is much more than just about you know, potential damage to your tissues. Okay, so the question, why pain science? Why do we care? Why is it important? One of, one of the first things is, is that this is a true interlab, international collaboration. Okay? It really does cross all boundaries. It's not about, I'm a doctor, you're a massage therapist, you're a physio, I do this, you do that, you do something else. It, it's really about everyone coming together, recognising the fact that actually, generally speaking, we don't do a great job with pain. And we're trying to figure out what is a good approach that we can all work on together. OK? 
Okay? And, and really what we're going to see with the research today is no one can claim superiority here. No one can sit up there and say, I know more than you, because it really isn't the case. And in fact, when you, when you see some of the leading experts in the field, they're, they're, they're actually generally very humble about what they're doing and realising that it's actually a very complex issue. We're making some inroads, but it really is, um, it, it's, a, it's a new frontier in so many ways. Um, one of the one of the things that's happening to us, we're breaking down a lot of these old paradigms, a lot of a lot of ways of thinking about you know care and patience and the human body and the way it functions, and that can be a little bit painful at times. It can, you know, pardon the pun, be a growing process, and with any growth, there can be pain, and it can mean letting go of old things. But the the good news is, is it does really mean that we can take hold of new things as well, and that's exciting because as therapists, we want to have some growth, we want to have some change. If we keep doing the same thing day in, day out, frankly, let's just get a robot to do that. That would be fine, you know? We want to be dynamic and changing, and, and you know, a lot of the points that uh, Lisa was highlighting is we want to work in with people. I, I saw a really good quote this morning saying, I can't fix your pain. I can be a coach to help you through a process. And I thought that was a really good way of putting it. You know, it's not my job to fix your pain. It's not necessarily your job either, but we can go through a journey together to improve your life. So one of the, the, the key points, with the, and this is the great thing with the research, is we have to really be patient-centred or client-centred. We can't operate in a, in a sense of, I'm going to dictate to you how this is going to work and you're going to do it. It just doesn't work. It's as simple as that. We have to really talk to that person, understand that person. I don't know about you guys clinically, but the breakthroughs for me always come when I finally realise what that person's saying to me. I'm a little bit slow, takes me a while, eventually we get there, and then once I, oh, okay, I, sorry, I get it now, I get it, that's when we usually have the breakthroughs. And it may not be a technique that I do, it might just be there's this mutual understanding and all of a sudden this clarity appears, and then we get some breakthroughs. Then things start to happen. Uh, as highlighted previously as well, the evidence can help us inform best practice. Now, best practice is probably one of these mythical creatures in some senses because we will have an idea of what best practice should be, but you probably never actually do it, if that makes sense. Because really, the, what the evidence will point to will be one particular thing. But in any one given moment in a clinical space, you've got to allow for a whole lot of factors, which is going to mean you'll be doing something different pretty much all the time. I do want to highlight the point of evidence-based practice as it stands, is not about just follow the science. That's not what it's about at all. It's integrating the science with your experience and your patient values. And it's finding that point between those three things where we're at that sweet spot. Okay, we're at that point where the magic happens. And if we drift off in any one of those directions, we're probably moving away from, from what should be best practice. Finally, pain science really does value some of the energy-saving approaches to massage. One of the pet bugbears of mine is assuming that more pressure is always better. Okay? That smashing someone is the ultimate form of therapy. Now, sure, I like strong pressure. A lot of people like strong pressure. And, and at, a, at the right place, at the right time, that's awesome. You know, get, get in there, go hard, that's, that's great. But it may not necessarily be for the reason that a lot of people think. And we'll, we'll get into that. OK, so to summarise some of the key points, the nervous system is something we should all be coming intimately aware of. Okay, generally in our training we get really, really good training musculoskeletal anatomy. Most of us will generally learn about origins, insertions, muscle actions, bony landmarks. We will get very good at palpation, hopefully, and we'll spend a lot of time exploring the musculoskeletal system of the body. Unfortunately, we can get very focused on that. In fact, perhaps too focused on that. Unfortunately, we probably don't learn enough about the nervous system, both anatomically and physiologically. I would encourage you, wherever possible, to learn more about that. And, and it's just a fascinating field of discovery. And it will inform what you do on a, on a whole new level. Um, thoughts, feelings, and emotions do matter. Okay? Now, if we just put aside um, energy concepts, metaphysical concepts for a moment, 
Um, if we think about every thought, feeling, emotion that occurs within your body, that is a physiological process. Okay? There is something going on, mostly in your nervous system, in response to that, that is creating that thought, that feeling, and that emotion. Sometimes we have this kind of assumption that feelings are not real things. They don't actually almost exist in, in a physical place, but they actually do. Okay? There, there is a signal going through your brain. There are areas of your brain that are active and functioning with every single sensation. And that is one of the big kind of paradigm shifts that we all need to sort of embrace because they matter. Emotions matter. Thoughts matter. And they do have a big effect on your pain. All right. Who's, uh, who's heard the term biopsychosocial? Has that... Okay, who has not heard the term biopsychosocial? That's good. Stretch those arms because otherwise we're going to get too static, aren't we? That's good. Very good. Okay, so biopsychosocial, if we break it down very simply, is a combination of biological factors. Okay, and generally speaking, what we're talking about is you know, tissue damage. Okay, got bitten by a shark. It's going to hurt. Okay, pretty much most of the time. But then we hear these remarkable stories, don't we? Someone gets bitten and then, oh, I felt a bump. And then the adrenaline kicks in, they race into shore, and oh, oh my goodness, you know. So biology matters, okay? But then there's also the psychological aspects of going on. Okay, your, you know, protective mechanisms kick in, that shark bites, you just, you're out of there, okay? Or you do something, you fight it off, you do something remarkable. You don't necessarily feel that pain until such time as you stop, okay? This, these are real stories. These things happen. The other fact we need to keep in mind is, is the social impact surrounding the person, okay? What's going on in their life? What's going on in their job? You know, we all talk about heartbreak, don't we, if we lose someone, something in our life, you know? You, if your dog goes lost for a couple of hours down the street, you, you suffer heartbreak, you panic, you know, you have a response to that. You can have all sorts of responses to social situations, and we need to be cognizant of that and realise that this affects pain. We need to now start considering the model of holism rather than reductionism. And maybe this is something that we've fallen into a bit of a trap because we're, we're trying to be scientific, we're trying to be mechanical, we're trying to do the best job we possibly can, and unfortunately we might sort of narrow down our focus. And that, that, that certainly happens a lot. We might focus on joint position or, or, or muscle tone or something like that. Sure, that can be important, but maybe we forget the person's actually talking about their leg and not their arm, okay? Because we might lose that communication. Touch is extremely important, and I'm really glad that Rebecca highlighted that story from David Butler. And is everyone familiar with David Butler, by the way? Yeah? Wonderful human being, someone I'd like to be like when I grow up. Um, a physiotherapist who's really transcended the boundaries of physiotherapy and become an educator to help people in pain. Really, you know, noble cause, wonderful human being. And it's just so good to hear him, you know, pick out a room of people, one person sticks their hand up, you know, lone massage therapist in the room, and he's like, you're the one. You're the one that gets to spend the most time with people physically connected and you can talk and connect with people, you know, in a room full of experts. And I think we should take note of that. It's really important. And look, finally, guys, words can hurt and heal. We really need to stop and take time to think about our language, how we talk to people. Um, Words can be motivating, life-changing, they can also be damaging. I don't know if you used the example today, Lisa, but you were talking about this last night, about someone who made the comment, I'm giving up the concept of having children because my back's not strong enough to handle it. That's, yeah, there's language that I want to use up here to describe that. That is awful is probably a good way of putting it because there might be some pain involved in having children. <laughs> but is that a valid reason to stop? I don't know, I don't know, but um, I think you understand the point. All right. Actually, I'm, I'm going to just take that back a step. So, I would like to assume that for a lot of us, now who, would, if we were talking about pain, okay, we want to reduce our pain levels or, or we're going to suggest to someone an approach to reduce pain levels. Um, would, put your hand up if you think, you know, sort of the most powerful effective mechanism for reducing pain 
would be medicine. I, that's what I would assume. Really? I'm, I'm, you must be a wonderfully intelligent, well-educated group of people. Um, how about in the public? Do you think a lot of the public would assume that medicine would be the most... Yeah, okay. Beautiful. And we probably assume that most people would assume opioid uh, analgesia, pain-killing medication, would be the single most powerful method for pain reduction. Okay. And, and, and please, this is not in any way medicine bashing at all. Okay. If you have surgery, you're pretty much guaranteed to be coming out on opioids. Okay. There's a reason for that, because it works really well. Okay. Um, but talking about low back pain, the poster child, the scantily clad fireman of the pain science world, the, it's used a lot to reference the effectiveness of all sorts of treatments. And there's been a ton of research published, particularly in the last two to three years, around low back pain, because it's this really elusive thing. Now, we would assume opioid medication should be top of the pops. This is where we're going to do a little bit of statistical talking. So here we go. For people with chronic low back pain who tolerate the medicine, that's a big issue, opioid analgesia provides modest short-term pain relief, but the effect is not likely to be clinically important within guideline recommended doses. Evidence on long-term efficacy is lacking and the efficacy of opioid analgesics in acute low back pain is unknown. That is not what I would describe as a gold standard statement. I don't know that that is what you would put your house on, so to speak, if you were, had low back pain. Okay, I'm not a statistician and I'm not a scientist, so I apologise for any misinterpretations that I make. You'll notice in there there's a, in brackets a statement MD minus 10.1. Okay, now MD, apart from standing for a medical doctor, is also an abbreviation for mean difference. So as my seven-year-old daughter would describe, it's taking things away from something else. It is a subtraction. So what we're looking at there is the VAS scale. Does everyone know what the VAS scale is? Okay, no, there's a few, few nods and a few shakes. So the visual analog scale, and it's, um, just hand up if you're a nurse, by the, by the way. How many nurses we got here? Is that all? You must be, the rest of them must be too busy working. So, um, so the visual analog scale is basically a measurement of pain, classic measurement of pain. And typically it's 10 centimetres long, 100 millimetres. And you mark a line on there that says, that's how much pain I'm feeling. Then you can overlay that measurement and you can mark it and you record that. What this is suggesting is that on a 100-point scale, on average, opioid analgesia will reduce your pain by 10 points. Now, when we ask people, on a scale of 1 to 10, where's your pain, opioid medication, according to this summary, will reduce your pain by 1 point. So it'll take it from an 8 to a 7, a 7 to a 6, a 6 to a 5. Does anyone, would anyone suggest that that is a good amount of pain reduction? I don't think so. So remember that as our baseline. Okay. Motor control exercises. Everyone sort of fairly comfortable with what a motor control exercise is. It's probably a very specific exercise, live in a very targeted way, probably very biomechanically focused. Move this, don't move that, control this, don't control that. That's another area that's been highlighted as being very effective for conditions such as low back pain. Let's have a look. Motor control exercise is probably more effective than a minimal intervention, meaning basically doing nothing except checking out and there's nothing serious going on, for reducing pain. But have a look at the statistical reference. Pretty much exactly the same as opioid analgesia. So motor control exercise is just as effective as the most powerful medications known to man for pain reduction in low back pain. Okay, that's a nice point to be aware of, if you're not aware already. So there was clinically no important difference between motor control exercise and other forms of exercises. And this, was, this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. Doing something really specific, targeted at your back, which should you know, t tighten your abs, tone your buttocks, whatever it is, is no more effective than basically doing general exercise. Okay, we're going to look at other forms of exercise that probably perform a lot better than really targeted motor control forms of exercise. Now, Pilates. We won't get sidetracked on the issues of the national rebates for private health insurance review. 
but Pilates was one of the ones that got the chop, okay? So there is low to moderate quality evidence that Pilates is more effective than minimal interventions for pain. Remember that mean difference figure we looked at before for opioid analgesia and motor control exercise? It's, thank you, it's greater than. So you are more effective. Now, generally speaking, clinical guidelines for reduction in pain of what would be considered a minimally effective amount is about 15, minus 15, okay? So Pilates is just around there, okay? Getting very close. Maybe not across the line, but very, very close. Okay, disability reduces by 0.795. That's actually not a wonderful score. So it could be better perhaps. And yet, we will see Pilates regularly used, particularly amongst physiotherapists, for managing pain and disability. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be used, but when we look at some of the figures, it's maybe not as impressive as we might hope. Okay, while there is some evidence for the effect of Pilates for low back pain, there is no evidence that it's superior to other forms of exercise. That's another important to keep in mind. Getting overly corrected with exercise may not be a good thing. Okay, yoga for low back pain. This is where it gets cool. My wife's a yoga instructor, by the way, so heavily biased up here, of course. Okay, 2013, this systematic review, systematic review is the highest form of evidence, by the way, found that strong evidence have we even seen the word strong yet? Nope. Strong evidence for short-term effectiveness with an SMD of negative 0.48. We'll explain what that is in a second. And moderate evidence for long-term effectiveness of yoga for chronic low back pain with an SMD of negative 30.33. Okay, yoga can be recommended as an additional therapy to chronic low back pain patients. Now, this was published in the Clinical Journal of Pain an international peer-reviewed journal in 2013, and yet it has deemed to be not effective for anything as far as private rebates are concerned, certainly by the government. Interesting when we look at the stats, isn't it? Now, if we go back to the SMD of minus 0.48, as long as I haven't misconstrued this, this stands for a standard mean deviation, which is now a little bit more about multiplication, multiplication, than subtraction. So basically what it would mean is it should reduce whatever the score is by about 48%. That halves your pain, is what it's saying. Okay, so if we go back and compare that to the opioid motor control Pilates, all of a sudden yoga's scoring off the charts. Exercise for chronic low back pain. Now, this is general exercise. Combined meta-analysis reveals significantly lower chronic back pain with intervention groups using exercise compared to a control group or other treatment groups. So the wonderful thing about this is they're comparing against basically doing nothing, placebo, and also other forms of therapy. And exercise is really coming through very highly in the management of low back pain. Again, we'll talk about why in a minute now, or perhaps why in a minute. So separate exploratory subgroups, analysts showed a significant effect for strength, resistance, coordination, and stabilization programs. So it does seem to be a little bit better in some cases to have a little bit of resistance, challenge yourself, but there is still some good evidence for things like walking, etc., as well. Now, when we get to the mental stuff, the brain stuff, so to speak, again, very good evidence for the use of these approaches. So. If we have a very mechanical view of the body, you know, we tend to focus on muscles, bones, fascia, etc. The interesting thing is when it comes to pain, if we stop there, we're probably doing our clients a disservice. So CBT, cognitive and behavioral therapies, are generally developing new beliefs about something, okay? Breaking down old beliefs, creating new ones. 2014, cognitive behavioral therapies Intervention, sorry, yield long-term improvements in pain with an SMD of 0.23 for no treatment, but compared to other forms, 0.48. So this is where it gets interesting. Now, I can't quite make sense of the stats here, but what it's essentially saying is compared to other forms of therapy and maybe their psychological interventions, it's generally 50% more effective. Compared to doing nothing, it's 0.23. By the way, 0.33 is generally considered to be clinically effective, so reducing someone's pain by a third. Okay, so a 9 to a 6, a 6 to a 4 would be clinically effective. Okay, now disability reduces disability by 0.19 compared to doing nothing. But 0.83, reducing disability by 
more than 80% compared to other forms of therapy. Maybe other forms of psychological therapy. It's hard to know exactly what they've compared it to, but very, very effective compared to many other forms of therapy. So if you're thinking about therapeutic approaches, cognitive and behavioural therapy should be something that should be considered. Um, so disability, quality of life in comparison to no treatment and other guideline-based active treatments for patients with low back pain of any duration, any age. Now you might think straight away cognitive behavioural therapies is something that a massage therapist should not do. That is not the case. Now not full-blown CBT interventions, that's not what we're saying, but breaking down the beliefs and understandings that people have and creating new ones is something that should be involved in every single process that you do as a massage therapist. I would put to you. So here we are. We're looking at now the Annals of Internal Medicine and as best I understand one of the big journals internationally in the world in the field of medicine. Perhaps, you know, top five medical journals in America. Oops, someone's got to do some push-ups. No? <laughs> um, it's not me, is it? Oh. Uh, so, non-pharmacological therapies for low back pain. So, so just to pause for a moment, there, there's, a, there's an epidemic, and this is not me saying this, but from medical literature, an epidemic of opioid use in America. Significant parts of the population are addicted to opioids, and it's not helping anyone. Maybe someone's making some money off it. That's about it. Okay? They realise that, medical practitioners realise that, and they're trying to do something about it. So we have things like non-pharmacological management to low back pain because as you saw with opioid analgesia, it doesn't work very well, if at all, and there's a lot of side effects. So here's what they recommend. New evidence indicates that Tai Chi, another modality that got stripped of private health rebate funding from the government, and mindfulness-based stress reduction. So we might just relate to mindfulness as meditation, awareness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mindfulness-based stress reduction are effective for chronic low back pain and strengthens previous findings regarding the effectiveness of yoga. That's right. Evidence continues to support the effectiveness of exercise, psychological therapies, multidisciplinary rehabilitation, spinal manipulation, and ladies and gentlemen, we have it, massage. <laughs> so we actually have recommendations from some of the top medical journals in the world to use massage as an intervention for low back pain. Okay, so you know we're talking about the way we reflect about ourselves and where we are in the food chain? Doctors are recommending <coughs> massage as a valid approach. Okay. Oh, by the way, and acupuncture. Please know that. You asked about sharp, pointy, stabby things before, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, absolutely valid, and, and as best I understand it, you know, and, and look, these rebates for private health care um, funding from the government should not necessarily be taken as, as a, you know, a basis for evidence of the, the effectiveness of a therapy, because a lot of the therapies that did get kicked off, it was an absence of evidence, okay, which didn't really say one way or the other. And who knows, maybe politics had something to do with it, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry? Well, that's what I was hoping someone might just pop off in the lunch break and get a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> just checking the time. Um, so the impact of massage therapy on function and pain populations, a systematic review and meta-analysis, randomised controlled trials, part one, patients experience pain in the general population. So this was published in the, Medi uh, the Journal of Pain Medicine, 2016. Okay, what is their opinion on massage? Based on the evidence, massage therapy compared to no treatment should be strongly recommended as a pain management option. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, you know, look, we all knew it. We, we don't want to oversell the benefits of massage, but we don't want to undersell it either, okay? If anyone here was in doubt, what are you doing here is my question to you. Um, <laughs> But the great thing is, is that we can point this stuff out to clients, other professionals, um, you know, medical practitioners. And, and, and I would say 99.999% you know, per of, of anyone's going to look at it and say, oh, that's, that's really good, and, and probably walk away with a positive belief around massage. So here we are, the American College of Physicians, in case you're wondering, they're medical practitioners in the United States. Guidelines for the management of low back pain. 
massage therapy has been included in the guidelines for both acute and chronic low back pain. Okay, so this is the official line. This was published April 2017, 4th of April 2017. This is the current standard for management of low back pain. We are in there along with many other therapies, but we are in there. Okay, so ultimately there were three guidelines recommended for the management of low back pain. Okay, the poster child of non-specific pain in the body. Guideline one. Given that most patients with acute or subacute low back pain improve over time regardless of treatment, clinicians and patients should select non-pharmacological treatment. Now, this is not the non-pharmacological guidelines. These are the general guidelines, okay? Non-pharmacological treatment with superficial heat, massage, who would have thunk it, acupuncture, spinal manipulation, and if pharmacologi pharmacological treatment is desired, clinicians and patients should select non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or skeletal muscle relaxants. Sorry, can I get a time check there, Rebecca? What are we? 15 minutes? Oh, I'm, 30, I'm going to have to start flicking through a few slides, so my apologies. Um, so point being, hold your head up high and get busy massaging. Okay, that's pretty much the moral to the story. For patients with chronic low back pain, clinicians and patients should initially select non-pharmacological treatment with exercise, multidisciplinary rehabilitation, acupuncture, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Mindfulness, please remember this. If it's not a thing you're engaged in doing, sharing, please start. And if it is, continue and have confidence in it. Okay. Uh, progressive relaxation, motor control exercise, electromyography, biofeedback, sounds fancy. Uh, Low-level laser therapy, operant therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, or spinal manipulation. Uh, massage is also re recommended in the guidelines. It's not in that summary right there. Okay, guideline number three. In patients with chronic lower back pain who have had an inadequate response to non-pharmacological therapy, clinicians and patients should consider pharmacological treatment with non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as the first line of therapy. So it's only once you've exhausted all those other options should we now start to consider medicine. That is what the medical practitioners are recommending. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, the other simple point was if you are going to go to op opioids, be very realistic about the use of it and please be aware of the side effects. Okay, we are not here to advise anyone on the use of medication. It might just be worthwhile to saying to someone that thinks opioids are really good to please talk to their GP about it and get a realistic picture about what's going on. Non-specific low back pain. So this is a very, very, very key point about non-specific low back pain. Now, this is the Lancet. Is anyone here not aware of who the Lancet is or, or what they represent? Okay, not sure. A few people not sure. Okay, generally considered to be the number one or two medical reference, peer-reviewed scientific journal in the UK. Okay, if something happens in the Lancet, it's generally big news. Really big news. Okay. This was February 2017, so very current. Most low back pain is non-specific, okay? non commonly cited as 90%. 90% of low back pain is non-specific, meaning, I'll talk about what it means in a, in a second, but in the previously mentioned Australian study, I haven't been able to get to the bottom of that yet, but it was an Australian study of 1,172 patients with acute low back pain, acute, low back pain, so it's pain that's just happened, fewer than 1% had specific causes for their pain. So what they're saying is they could not identify a disc, a lesion, a bruise, a fracture, a tumour, and anything. In 90% of cases generally, and in this one study in Australia, in 99% of cases. Now, I would like to assume that they, this is a multidisciplinary approach. Physios are involved, osteopaths are involved, massage therapists are involved. And ultimately, it's really, really, really difficult to na nail down what drives pain. But in 10% of cases, there are clear mechanical causes. Okay? And that is something we want to keep in mind, because there are 10% of people that probably walk in with a bad back, bad back, who might actually need some sort of other assistance, okay? referral, yeah, potentially surgery, some sort of medical intervention. They do exist and we need to be very aware of them. The good thing is, is actually when, we, when these people come in, we can actually do some of those clinical special orthopedic tests and they are highly accurate. Okay? It's everyone else that we are not very accurate in diagnosing. Okay, so fear avoidance beliefs in lower back pain are basically 
we've got this assumption that if you're fearful about your back, you're worried about hurting your back, your pain gets worse. Okay, that's an assumption. It's been validated. Okay? So evidence suggests that fear avoidance beliefs are prognostic for poor outcomes in subacute and chronic low back pain. In other words, if you're worried about your back and hurting it more, you're more likely to go downhill okay, for it to get worse. Fear, not posture, not strength, fear. Okay? So it matters what we say and what we do. It matters. Mindfulness. Okay? Treatment with mindfulness or CBT compared to usual care resulted in greater improvement in back pain and functional limitations in 26 weeks. Just focusing on relaxation, positivity, positive beliefs, reducing fear, building confidence will reduce your back pain. That's the moral to the story. This does affect other pain as well. It's just that back pain, is, low back pain in particular, is one very clear area where this stuff matters. This was basically the paper presented by Tasha Stanton last year, which showed us that feelings of stiffness in your back do not necessarily relate to being stiff. So just because your back feels stiff doesn't mean you're losing flexibility, is basically the moral to the story. What? <laughs> they didn't tell me that at college. Um, my apologies, I am going to have to move through this last slides a little bit briefly. So ultimately, what does this come down to? Okay, we have all this research now. It's time to actually start to rethink the way we manage low back pain, but pain in general. Just, just the, what pain is, how we treat it, and what do we do about it. And, and basically, we have some models that are, that are coming together, and, and I would love for you to investigate these and learn more about these, because they really validate a lot of what you're probably already doing. Okay. Uh, yep, Abraham Maslow. So, if you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. If I have an elbow and I love trigger points, I see every problem as a trigger point. <laughs> and believe me, I've seen a lot of trigger points. Um, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs went, as discussed previously, from physiological to safety. Safety is a really big thing. We just talked about fear, confidence in your body. This affects your pain. So if, you, if you're bleeding, you don't care about your pain. You get your bleeding fixed up, okay, then you worry about your pain. And once that's good, now we want to start to have love and connection in our life. And this matters. This is the social dimension of what we are talking about before. This impacts on your pain. If you're supported, you'll generally cope better. If you're feeling not supported, you will generally struggle. Esteem and self-confidence is huge when it comes to pain. We're actually talking about psychological needs of the person here, but this absolutely reflects the pain experience. And finally, we have this pinnacle of self-actualization. The, the, the term self-efficacy is really important, the belief that you can get better. In, in certain studies, they looked at all these different factors, what it came down to, the one thing they could define that would indicate if someone got better with pain or not was self-efficacy, the belief they got better. Not their strength, not their fitness, not the position of their pelvis or their sacrum, but the belief they would get better. Okay? A psychological dimension. Um, now, one of the broader things is that when we learn our diploma, we're very heavily focused on mechanical drivers, special orthopedic tests, position, muscle length, bone, structure, alignment, posture, all these sort of factors. And that, in that 10%, that stuff works really well. In the 90%, as we've just been discussing, if we're very mechanical, we're missing 60% of the person, at least. Okay. So we have the biopsychosocial model. Biology, physiology, I suppose. The personal aspects of your, your feelings, your beliefs about your pain, what you want to do with your life. You know, how you feel you're going to get better, what will you engage in, what will you not engage in, what will you do, and then in the environmental factors around you. Your work, your life, your stress. Do you live in a cold place? Do you live in a warm place? Okay, what are the drive, what impacts your life? Can you get sleep at night or do you live next to a nightclub? You know, it's, these things matter to your pain. So, if we break them down a little bit further, and I should, sorry, reference the authors. Does anyone here speak French? I apologise to you if you do. I, I, my best interpretation is Tuzignon La Flemme. I should recognise them because with other researchers, including Chad Cook, they've put together this model and I've adapted this. I've sort of changed the language a little bit to, to summarise it. So we have the biopsychosocial factors. 
And so we have psychological drivers which include nociception. We get very heavily focused around nociception and assuming that it's all about nociception. Nociception, by the way, is basically a signal going from an area of tissue up to your brain saying there's something irritating here. That does not mean you'll get pain. It just means there's some sort of irritation going on. Neuropathy is something I hopefully we all are becoming more aware about. What this means is there's something going on in the nervous system which is highlighting your pain, is making your pain more intense, you feel it more, even though you might not have any damage. And please remember what the Lancet said, 90% of back pain is no clear cause. Okay? It's the nervous system for some reason is creating a pain response when there's no, no identifiable damage. No medical test will show up anything. Personal factors, mental health, sleep. Sleep is huge. Ask your clients, how's your sleep going? Okay. Is massage any good for helping people to sleep? Yeah. Long lectures are also really good for helping people to sleep as well. <laughs> so maybe just like go wow, 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 wow. And your client falls asleep and you're doing them a service, okay? <laughs> Beliefs around pain, as we've highlighted, really, really important, okay? Changing beliefs around pain, being positive, finding new opportunities, immensely important. Environmental factors, occupation, employment, relationships, external demand, this stuff does matter. You might not be a social worker, you might not be the person to help that individual, but you might be the person who can say, this matters, you do need to get assistance and you do need to do something about this, because it will help you. So, if we're treating from a nociceptive perspective, okay, someone's come in and got a sprained ankle, all of our classic focus is there, reducing muscle tone, touch, mediated analgesia, okay, we know you touch someone, the pain reduces, just, just through touch, you don't have to do anything special, just touch them. We can focus on biomechanical approaches, taping, all that sort of stuff, highly important. If someone has sensitised nervous system, then start to think about things such as mindfulness, placebo effects, um, language, those sort of things really matter. So, so also look for opportunities with things such as exercise, activity and whatnot because all of those have a pain reducing effect as the evidence showed us. doesn't need to be anything special. Probably what matters more is that the person does it. Okay? So find something they'll engage in and know that it can be good for their pain. Uh, and then finally help the person to understand pain because people have a lot of beliefs around pain that are not well informed and we can help them to understand that and that in itself has been shown to reduce pain. Okay? Reducing the threat and understanding what's going on is really very helpful. Mental health benefits of relaxation CBT, as we talked about, mindfulness are very clear. So again, with massage, relaxation and just helping someone to calm down are huge. It will affect their pain. It will have generally a positive effect on their pain. Beliefs around pain, as we've talked about, pain education is really important. We don't want to talk the person's ear off, but having discussions about what's going on, how can we, and just ask yourself the question, how can I get this person being more positive about what's going on? Okay? It doesn't have to be all about evidence, it's just how can we get them more positive? Reducing protective behaviours, fear about movement, these things are really important as well. Don't have enough time to really dive into that right here and now, but they matter. Okay. Self-efficacy self we touched on. Again, relaxation, sleep, regulation. We know that massage is very helpful with these. External factors, occupation and employment. Now, occupation, very simply, is something that's meaningful to that person. It's not just a job. If someone's in a job they hate, there's a good chance that could affect their pain. If they're in something they love, the pain won't bother them so much. Okay. Tell them to negotiate with their employer. Seek advocacy, get support, go and do something about it. Your role might just be to say, do something. I'll help you, I'll point you in the right direction. Might not be to solve the problem for them, but point them in the right direction. Okay, relationships matter. Highlighting to people that relationships will affect their pain will affect their experience. That is a very important point, because some people think it just, it's just got nothing to do with it. I had, a, I had a breakup, but my back's really hurting. You need to smash it with elbows, that'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me to never upset you. <laughs> um, it's on wheels. Um, Encourage to seek assistance, you know, look, and look, finally, probably the sing single last point is that if you can create a positive environment, you know, the, the, the space you work in, okay, it doesn't have all these scary pictures of half decapitated bodies with things ripped out of it and they're called anatomy charts. Um, so, 
And you have stuff that looks great. You know, if you've got a footy player up or a ballet dancer or a yoga pose or something, that might actually create an environment. It's a bit more inspiring than threatening as well. So please just keep that in mind. So um, anatomy charts are great if you de-threaten them. Okay. How are we doing for time there, Rebecca? Are we? Okay. So let's finish on this note. There are some other slides here which can be shared with you later and you can have a look at. Okay. So I would summarise everything we've said here today by this. In the middle of everything that you do should be your client. Biomechanics do matter. Function does matter. Okay? If you're learning to pitch, there's a technique. Okay? And you have to learn that technique and you have to throw in that way. The better you get at that, the better your performance. But if your goal isn't to pitch, throw, jump, run, okay, then biomechanics probably aren't that important to your pain. Touch mediated analgesia, just touching people helps, okay? Just know that. You don't have to necessarily do anything fancy. Just because you haven't learned that certain course or technique that everyone else has doesn't make them better than you. Look at the evidence. The evidence does not support chiropractic over massage or massage over acupuncture or acupuncture over anything else. They all generally come in about the same, okay? Because they touch, they interact, they work with people. They can be effective, but no one has got claim to superiority. Except maybe us, no. <laughs> social grooming. Please remember, social interaction with people is important. You know, we, 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 we behave, we connect with people. That is really an important thing. Just having a, a normal conversation with someone can be incredibly powerful. You don't have to counsel them, you don't have to do anything. Just have a conversation, just be there. That person goes, oh, that was really normal. Okay, that is really powerful. It wasn't awkward, it wasn't weird, I didn't get, some, it was just a normal conversation. That is a powerful thing. And finally, we want to create an environment of education for growth. Okay? Don't freak the people out. Don't freak our clients out. Don't give them beliefs that they're afraid of, scared of. Just create an environment where they can, they can grow. And that's going to be heavily driven by them, not you. All right, thank you very much. We'll leave it at that point. There is some more information if you want to check out later. He obviously had heaps more to say and he's going to be here all weekend. So grab him. Ask him what slides we didn't get to see. He's kind of like a ninja, isn't he? He's all calm and collected and then wham, research. Except instead of being, you know, doubled over in pain, we're like, yeah, massage. We need to really quickly move on because we have a speaker coming to us in a different format via Skype. Uh, and her topic is something that might take you a bit by surprise at an AMT conference. But the fact is that this topic crosses lines into our industry. Erina. Uh, Erina <laughs> is here with us. Erina uh, is the Prevention and Awareness Coordina Coordinator at A21, a global non-profit organisation with a mission to end slavery through awareness, intervention and aftercare. Erina has worked with A21 for over five years and is motivated by a passion for people and the firm conviction that we can indeed abolish slavery in our lifetime. And we need to hear this because we care. Erina join us, joins us via Skype from A21's Sydney office to tell us about modern slavery and its intersection with a range of industries in Australia and to give an insight into why massage therapists should be aware of the issues. Obviously, see my face, but unfortunately, can't see you all. But um, a little fact about 